so today I was charged with discussing the hip spine syndrome um, and what order uh, to be to, to tackle generative joint disease of the hip and the spine um, when we're taking on patients that are uh, experiencing both of these um, pathologies. And um, I want to first start with my disclosures. Please note I am a consultant for Smith & Nephew. Um, they do manufacture uh, total hip arthroplasty implants. And so you just need to be aware of that. Otherwise, my uh, disclosures don't really pertain to this topic. I want to first uh, thank the Korean American Spine Society for having uh, the interest in this hip spine syndrome. And I want to acknowledge and uh, thank my colleague and friend, Don Park, for inviting me today. This is really a huge honor for me. Um, and I would also like to thank you guys for providing me with a very focused question because this is a large blossoming uh, topic in, in both the arthroplasty and the spine world. And so I think that focusing the topic has, has been really helpful, but we're going to uh, take a literature-based approach to deciding which surgery should be performed first in dealing uh, with the hip spine syndrome. So uh, toward that end, we're going to first highlight the importance of the hip spine syndrome. We're going to showcase uh, the effects of spine fusion on total hip arthroplasty outcomes. That's when the spine fusion is performed both before and after a hip replacement. And then we're going to discuss comparatively how these effects may how how these effects may determine your choice of which surgery to be performed first. And then I'll go over my literature supported uh, treatment algorithm for these patients. So really briefly, uh, as you as you uh, no, the hip spine syndrome really is defined by concurrent existence of degenerative joint disease in both the hip and the spine. We know that total hip arthroplasties and lumbar spinal fusions have excellent results in both pain relief and improving function in these patients, but there's really no established guidelines on which problem to tackle first. When I was first delving into this research topic, uh, it can be quite daunting, especially for a hip surgeon, because we're frankly not as smart as you guys. And so um, ultimately, when we see these schematics with lots of angles, um, it can be a little bit uh, off-putting. I have subsequently simplified a lot of these things into um, understanding that um, at its most basic foundation, positioning the leg relative to the axial skeleton is a dual hinge mechanism. And there's a posterior hinge that's represented by the spinal pelvic segment, and there's an anterior hinge that's represented by the femoral acetabular segment. And when one hinge is, is stiff, the demand on the other hinge is increased such that you need more motion to position the leg relative to the axial skeleton. And I think that's really at the crux and the most important relationship that we can understand moving forward is how these two things have an interplay uh, following um, our respective surgeries. Um, let's see, advance. I'm having trouble, oh, here we go. Um, so we think of the scope of this problem as it relates to our patients. We have about 50% of uh, patients undergoing a hip replacement have low back pain. About a quarter of them have seen a spine surgeon prior to their hip replacement. Uh, over 40% of patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty have a sagittal spinal deformity. About 4% have undergone um, uh, prior spine surgery before their total hip arthroplasty. And we know that pre-existing spine disease and surgery are associated with lower patient-reported outcomes post-total hip arthroplasty. And the real impact of all of these things is that when you look at the rate of dislocation in all comers for total hip replacement, it's about 2 to 4% based on modern Medicare data. When you look at the rate of dislocation in patients with hip spine syndrome, and whether that's spine disease, spine stiffness, or having previously undergone a spinal fusion, that rate jumps up to about eight to 18%. And to put that in perspective, that's, com that's very comparable to rates of dislocation we see in revision total hip replacement, specifically for instability. Um, patients that have compromised trochanters and um, gluteal muscular attachments, and then also in patients that are undergoing mega prostheses for oncologic purposes. So extremely high rates of dislocation, uh, in, in a very sort of common patient presentation in our practice. We also know that looking at the literature, there's poor outcomes when total hip arthroplasty is done after a prior lumbar spine fusion. Okay, we can look at this across many different um, literature-based formats, 
meta-analyses have demonstrated a relative risk of about two for dislocation and 3.3 for revision of, in THA patients that have had previous uh, lumbar spine fusion. The single institution matched cohort study performed at UCSF demonstrated higher complication rates, including dislocations, infections, readmissions, inability to undergo spinal anesthetic, prior to total hip arthroplasties, again, in a matched cohort study. When we broaden our net, when we look at New York State Sparks Registry, this is probably the most damning uh, of all of the reports in the literature, but Patients that have had previous fusion are seven times more likely to dislocate and 4.6 more times likely to need a revision in the first year following their total hip arthroplasty, which is um, pretty scary. So uh, to broaden our net further, if you look at the Medicare data from 2005 to 2012, and you divide patients into three groups, either not having undergone a pr prior spinal arthrodesis, a one to two level, versus a three or more level spinal arthrodesis, you notice a rise in dislocations, complications, need for revision, and you can see that longer constructs did worse. The green bars represent control patients not undergoing spinal fusion prior to their total hip, blue bars are a short segment fusion, and then the red bars are long segment fusion. So pretty definitive results there. But what about patients that have had a total hip that then go on to require a spinal arthrodesis, okay? That's these patients down here this ten, that, that are in this Medicare population, roughly 10,000 over that same time period. And um, when, you look at, when you look at the results of those patients, take for instance this study that came out of that same SPARC database in, in New York State, okay? We note that if you divide patients into no subsequent fusion, a subsequent short fusion defined as two to three levels in this study or a longer fusion, you see similar findings with an increased rate of dislocation, complications and need for revisions, and longer constructs having less favorable outcomes than shorter constructs following a total hip arthroplasty. However, this data is somewhat um, uh, mitigated by the fact that there's really no spike in the dislocation of these patients when they have their fusion following their total hip arthroplasty. Yes, their overall rate of dislocation is higher than the control population, but it's not happening immediately after uh, their spinal fusion. And this may be more reflective of just having spinal disease concurrently in the setting of uh, hip arthritis or having already undergone a hip replacement. And if you look at the slope, of um, dislocations as a, as a survivorship um, a statistic, you can see that these two curves follow very similar slopes um, and, and really sort of parallel each other with the uh, patients with spinal disease having poor outcomes, but not really having a steep drop off after their um, spinal fusion following a total hip replacement. And again, this doesn't change based on whether we're talking about gender, age, Charlson comorbidity index, index, or in this study, uh, even the length of the fusion. And so let's look at, let's look at uh, head to head studies in the literature. Um, this is probably one of the better studies out there. This is again, the same Medicare database looking at 90 day and two year outcomes. When you look at the 90 day outcomes and you divide patients, whether or not they've had a total hip after a lumbar spinal fusion, whether they have had a total hip arthroplasty in the setting of spine pathology without spine pathology or following a lumbar spine fusion after a total hip replacement, you can see that these are the dislocation and revision rates. And actually, the patients that had the lumbar spine fusion after their total hip did best in this study for short, uh, for short term outcomes. Okay. And uh, to the tune of uh, uh, about an absolute risk reduction of you know 2.6 percent uh, when compared to total hips following lumbar spine fusion. So pretty dramatic difference. And then at two years, a very similar uh, trend. You see total hip after lumbar spine fusion doing the worst as it relates to dislocation with lumbar spine fusion following total hip actually doing the best in this group. Um, and so. Um, that, that begs the question, why? why is that the case? Well, it's possible that it has to do with the fact that the, the patients that have already had their hip replacement and are doing well have a well-functioning 
total hip and a stiff spine. There may be some selection bias in this data because patients that have had previous dislocations of a hip replacement may not go on to get a needed spinal fusion because they're in and out of the hospital with their dislocating hip, or they may be deemed unfit surgical candidates for subsequent spine surgery. There's also the, the effect of post-operative precautions imposed following a lumbar spine fusion, which may dis decrease their subsequent dislocation risk. My personal opinion is that bio biology plays the strongest role. And that if you look at patients that have had a total hip arthroplasty prior to a lumbar spine fusion, these are patients that have osseointegrated components, their hip capsule is healed, their muscles have been rehabilitated, and they're probably in general just more tolerant of potentially minor changes occurring after a lumbar spine fusion with respect to the antiversion of the components. If you look at lumbar spine fusion occurring prior to total hip arthroplasty, the demand on the range of motion of that anterior hinge between the femoral acetabular segment is increased because of the stiff spine. And now you're asking more from an unstable environment in the acute postoperative period following a total hip arthroplasty. And I think this is what's playing the largest role in terms of the discrepancies we're seeing between the two order of, of these procedures in these patients in the Medicare population. Now, if this is true, you would expect the longer you wait after a total hip arthroplasty, your risk of dislocation would go down in subsequent lumbar spinal fusion. And that's in fact what we do see. So if you look at the Medicare data and you compare dislocation rates in patients that have a THA or total hip arthroplasty with a prior fusion represented by the purple line here, and then you look at patients that have a lumbar spine fusion one, two, and five years after a total hip arthroplasty, the rates of dislocation decrease the further out you get from your total hip arthroplasty. And so I think that that really paints a good picture as to what is the safest course of action. So I think in the setting or absence of you know, some pen, you know, uh, pending neurologic deficit, I think uh, the THA should be done first. I think the keys to doing the THA require careful component placement, and that's based on the type of spine deformity and the stiffness, and as well as other neuromuscular considerations, which is a whole another lecture in and of itself, but you, I typically try and maximize the offset in these patients. I recommend a multi-hole cup with the dual mobility bearing uh, to help um, prevent dislocation, removing sources of bony impingement, and then aggressive intraoperative trialing of components to make sure that they're not dislocating through an extremely functional range of motion. I just want to say thanks so much for uh, allowing me to participate in this lecture. Um, this is really a huge honor for me. Uh, as a Jewish hip surgeon to be presenting at a Korean spine meeting, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Growing up in LA, I was uh, thankfully immersed in, in the Korean community, uh, participating in Taekwondo a lot during my youth. And that's something I've got to pass on to my daughters and uh, they've been able to enjoy that sport. And this has just been a tremendous honor for me uh, to be able to present here today. I wish I was able to hang out with you guys in person, um, but hopefully in future years. So thank you.